Russell Westbrook is having one of his worst seasons yeah. on the biggest stage. What advice would you give him? So I would just face it. You know, I would just, whatever the questions y'all ask me, whether I think it's a dumb question or something that is self-explanatory or whatever, just face it and deal with it or whatever. Like his, his, Russell Westbrook's career and legacy is undeniable. Like that's just the bottom line. The player, the career he's had, what he's accomplished, the things that he's done, nobody else has been able to do it. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got the roll of dice, that's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Yeah. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got the roll of dice, that's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Hello, welcome to another edition of Club Shay Shay. I am your host, Shannon Sharp. I'm also the proprietor of Club Shay Shay, and the guy that's stopping by for conversation and a drink today really needs no introduction. He's a six-time NBA All-Star, Olympic gold medalist, a member of the 75th anniversary team, Dame Time, Logo Lillard, one of the best NBA players of all time, and I believe he's the greatest rapper in NBA history. Say hello to Damian Lillard. Dame, how you doing, bro? Good, man. How you doing? Let's start with this. Of all the accomplishments that I just mentioned, six-time NBA All-Star, Olympic gold medal, a medalist, I forgot to mention, you're an all-NBA player, 75th anniversary team. Of those accomplishments right there, which do you think is the most significant one to you? Uh, I would have to say the 75th anniversary team. Uh, and when, it, when I was announced on the team, I didn't even really know it was a... Um, a real thing. I thought it was just, you know, people throwing their opinion out there who the 75 best players ever were. And then when it was like announced and I saw people posting it and people, you know, was calling me like, you on the team. I thought it was just like a, a <laughs> everybody was doing. So I was like, Man. I actually wasn't even keeping track of it to see if I was going to be on the team because I didn't know it was a real thing. And um, after it was announced, you know, it was a it was a great honor for me, man. Um, especially with with myself just playing, you know, ten years now. And um, when I got to Cleveland, it really it really set in. Like, man, you know, I'm looking around. Like, do I belong here with these dudes? You know, what I mean? like, it was crazy, and that that made me realize how how great of an accomplishment. When you're in that room and you look around and you see Dr. J and Akeem Elijah one, and you see Mike and you see Magic and La you see all these guys, and you're like, man, I'm here. Did you reflect like, man? A kid from Oakland, a guy that they said never was gonna make it. I'm in the room with the legends. No, nah, it was if there was ever any moment in my career of like validation, that was it. You know, right. and, and like I said, I was in there and I was looking around like, man, do I do I belong in here? Like this is really the best of the best. You know, right. I played a video game with these dudes. I bought these dudes shoes. You know, the whole nine. So like it was. If it was ever a moment of validation, that was it. And then to have so many of them come up to me and tell me, like, no, nah, you you deserve to be here. You know, you you earned your way here. So um, just knowing that something like this is not just a, you know, a selection or a media selection of people or, you know, random people getting to decide who the best are. You know, that's for somebody to come up with a list like this. It was a lot of a lot of homework being done. on right. How you will be on this list. And that to me, that was the, the best feeling of all. Dame, you know, a lot of times we like when people say, well, we don't want validation, but we do because we play. We want the ultimate validation. We want other greats to say, yeah, you're one of us. You are yeah. historic. You're a pantheon great also. So to get that ultimate validation from a Magic Johnson or a Michael Jordan or whomever the greats were to come up to you and say, Dame, bruh, shake your hand. You belong in this room. Hey, I mean, it's a feeling that I, I can't even describe to you because I was literally looking around the room like that. <laughs> you know, Kareem, you know, when Jordan walked in, I'm looking around like, man, this is crazy. Like, I'm not here to just witness this. I'm a part of this group. Like, I'm You're in right. the picture that we taking and I got this blazer that they all wearing. It was, it was crazy. And like you said, to hear it from those guys. It does seem surreal. I remember being in the Hall of Fame room, Dame, and, and seeing Mean Joe Green and the Buckuses and these guys. And I'm like, hold on, wait a minute. How did I end up here? How did a, a kid from a population, a town of 3,500 people, went to Savannah State, to HBCU, another 3,000 students? How did I get in this room? 
and then you see them and they start shaking your hand, they patting you on the back. Man, I followed your career. You're an unbelievable player. Welcome to the club. Man. So it is a great feeling. Congratulations. You're well deserving of this honor. Uh, like you said, only 10 years. So guess what? In, and when they have the 100th anniversary team and there'll be young players and you get called back for the 100th anniversary team and then you're going to be like, man, I'm in a room with Dame Lillard. I'm in a room with LeBron. I'm, but when you, did you ever think you would be in, did you ever think you would be like, you said you didn't understand with the 75th anniversary team. Did you ever think you'd be considered an all-time great? No, I've never, I've never looked that far into it. You know, like I've always been a, uh, somebody that's in the moment, you know, because the that's how my steps have always been in my career, you know, right. not being heavily recruited, going to, to a small school. I've never been afforded the opportunity to just look past certain things, you know, where right. it might be certain kids now that's like, you know, I want to go uh, to a team that fits me instead of thinking about, man, I want to try to get in the tournament. I right. want to get picked. I want to earn some minutes. You know, I've always had to stay in the moment, and that's how my steps have always been. So I've never looked far enough down the line to say I want to be one of the best ever. It was like one thing at a time. Um, so for it to come is just it's just crazy, man. Damn, you had surgery, I believe, on a core muscle. Yeah. I'm watching you. I've followed your career since you got into the NBA in 2012. You're unanimous, uh, all rookie. Uh, the uh, rookie of the year selection, and so I've watched you. I'm watching you at the the Olympics. That's when I really first noticed it, and I say, man, he's missing shots. He makes in his sleep. He's doing things that's very uncharacteristic. I watch you into the season. Did you think it was like, man, I'm just having a bad. I'm just having a bad shooting. I'm in a slump, but I'm okay. When did you know something was really wrong with Dane? Oh uh, no, I knew. I knew I was hurt. Uh... You know, and I think everybody that I was at the Olympics with would tell you, like, I knew I was hurt. They knew I was hurt. It was just, um, I've never had a a situation where I was hurt and I couldn't overcome it. You know, right. I think that was the biggest hurdle for me is, like, I knew I was hurt and people knew I was hurt. But I, in my head, I was like, I just got to, I just got to, you Fight know, overcome it. I just got to keep fighting. And I just got, you know what I'm saying? And then in my head, I'm like, I'm not an excuse maker, so I don't care how much I'm not looking myself. You know, even if it's through whatever this rough patch is, I'm going to find a way to get there. Um, and then as the season went on, eventually I just got to the point where it was like, uh, you know, my my mind wanted my body to do something that it just wasn't in good enough health to do, you know, and I had to, you know, I had to look myself in the mirror and make that decision. Dame, as athletes, we're wired to have the surgery, have whatever it is, and get back as soon as we possibly can because my brothers are out there fighting and I don't want them to fight alone, so I need to get back as soon as I possibly can so I can be there and fight with them. When did you say, you know what, this is a, this is a situation I can't rush back. I got to do what's in the best interest of Dane, although I want to be there fighting with my brothers. Uh, I mean, when I did my homework on the, the procedure that I was having, um, you know, I spoke to athletes that had been through the surgery that I went through. Um, I had a lot of talks with my surgeon before the surgery and after. Like to this day, we still talk regularly. Um, and as well with the PT, um, Kara, you know, she's uh, somebody that I spoke to, you know, every single day pretty much. And she's the PT that works with my surgeon. And she had the surgery herself. Okay. So um, her kind of being with me every step of the way and knowing the symptoms and the feelings that I'm going through and going through the process herself and also being a professional to, to get me back on track has been great, you know, plus my PT here in Portland, Eric, is uh, is well-versed in it as well. So um, I, I've done the homework and I know that it's a process that I got to be careful about and I got to make sure that I'm checking every box and not rushing through that. You know, I don't want right. to do it to try to be like, all right, I'm back and I'm healthy. You know, I want to check every box and, I'm not looking at 100, I'm looking at 150. Like, are we absolutely sure? Am I right. strong in this area? I'm looking for every vulnerable spot that I can put myself in to, you know, try to find that that place where I might be re-aggravating something just so I know I'm good. And I'm not gonna rush, I'm not gonna rush through that process because when I do come back on the court, you know, I don't plan on having anything in the way. And um, 
I want to perform at a level, a level that I wasn't even playing at before this. So, I mean, that's the only way to go is to take my time and make sure I'm doing it right. So how are you feeling? How far along are you in the process? So, so when you, are you shooting? Are you doing anything uh, with, with the bas that's basketball related or are you still uh, rehabbing? Uh, well, I mean, I had surgery on January 13th and um, I was cleared to kind of move forward with doing stuff on the court. So I've been, I've been going pretty aggressive, you know, right. and, uh, you can't just say, all right, I'm okay. You got to start searching for those areas where it's like, I feel good, but like, let's, let's go searching for something. Let's go searching for something that could come up if it's just reactive or if I'm at this angle or if I'm in this vulnerable position and then let's try to be strong in that position. And then you try to find another spot like that just to make sure that um, everything is where it needs to be, you know, changing direction, being in, you know, lower to the ground and twisting and spinning and, doing reaction drills and doing things full speed, coming to a stop, changing direction, things like that, where um, you're literally trying to find something that, oh, this could bother me, that could bother me. And then, you know, you do the recovery stuff, the soft tissue work, the stretching, the hot tub, the cold tub, and you come back and do it again. That's kind of the stage that I'm in is just getting more and more aggressive. And um, that's also a process that I'm gonna take my time getting through. Well, since you've been away, a lot of things have transpired. Um, you started losing some games. They trade CJ. They trade Norman Powell. They trade Covington. What's going through your mind when you learn of this? Like, okay, me and CJ, we've been in this thing. We kind of built this thing. What with the new trailblazers, the way you see them now, CJ and I had a big hand in this, building this thing. What were your reaction to the trade? And why weren't you and CJ quite able to get to the, to the, 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 the championship game, maybe win the chip? Um, I mean, when the trade happened, it, I mean, it, it hurt me, you know, um, it, it hurt me, you know, to this day, I still, you know, when I, I tell CJ all the time, even now when we still talk, you know, I'm like, man, I'm watching these games. I can't believe you play for the Pelicans, you know, like, <laughs> it's crazy. And he telling me like, yeah, man, it's, it's been cool, but it's weird, you know, like it's right. different for me. And, uh, me and C, we wasn't just teammates, you know, a backcourt. We like was really partners, you know. Right. So it's it's tough to deal with, it. and I think the fact that I haven't had to actually play without him um, has allowed it to be like more of a smooth transition than it would be if I was actually playing. It'd be real weird for me. Right. Um, but that one that one hurt me, man. To this day, um, and it, to to answer about uh, us not being able to, you know, get, get over get it. Um, I think you know we did what we could. Uh, you know, me and CJ every season at the beginning, of every season before camp, we would, you know, meet up with each other and it would be the same conversation. Like, look, it's going to be times that I'm going to get on your ass. I need you to accept it. It's going to be time where you're going to get on my ass and I'm going to accept it. We got to right. hold each other to that standard. And no matter what happened, if we, if we struggling, if we doing well, you know, if, if people talking bad about us or whatever, we're going to fight together. We're going to fight our way out of it. And that was right. like something we always had. And I knew I could count on that and trust that. So, you know, once you get to that top level, you know, it's, it's not just about me and CJ at that point, you know, and we weren't a, a healthy team. We didn't have Nurk in the Western Conference Finals. I feel like that would have gave us a much better chance. Um, but the deeper that you get in the playoffs, teams just start to take things away from you, you know? Right. And, they give you more attention. Like I'm getting double teams and I'm getting trapped and, you know, CJ is getting more attention and it forces you to, you know, they, they going to put the ball where they want teams are going to force the ball to go where they want the ball to go. Yes. Um, sometimes that's putting guys in a position that they haven't been in mm -hmm. um, a lot. And at the biggest stage, you know, with the most on the line. So, um, you know, that can be tough because even if somebody's going to come through and play well, um, it's hard to sustain that when that hasn't been what you've had to do. Right. Um, and CJ, me and CJ didn't play our best in that series, you know, right. up to that point. And, um, you know, I think it, a lot of things go into that. You know, we hadn't played that far into the postseason. Sometimes you just don't play well. Um, and the season being longer, you know, I think teams now, guys are able to, to rest throughout the season. You know, in the 80-game mm -hmm. season, you know, they might not play back-to-backs and they – at the end of the year, maybe they played in 61 games. You know, that's 21 nights off as opposed to, you know, the way our team has been set up, we've we've had to fight every night. Right. We've had to play every night. And, you know, that can be exhausting. And that's something that, as I've gotten older, you realize that 
Um, when you plan on playing further into the postseason, you gotta you gotta play chess. You know, you gotta make sure that your body and your mind is able to be there for the long haul. And um, I think all of those things played a part in us not being able to, you know, actually get get to where we wanted to get to. You got thirty million dollars under the cap. You have two lottery picks. Dame is the general manager. What we go? What we looking for? How how do we get? How do we get? Portland to be what we see the Phoenix Sun. We saw them go eight and zero in the bubble. Continue to build the next year, and here they are to have the have the best record in the NBA. H- how does Dane do that in Portland? He's the general manager. You got thirty million under the cap, and you got two lottery picks. Um, if I'm the general manager, I'm looking at like you just said. I'm looking at what Phoenix did. You know, nobody saw Phoenix coming. You know, it was like, man, you know, you had. People saying Devin Booker should should leave and Devin Booker should do this. And Phoenix is, you know, they want they were considered one of the bad teams, you know. Right. Me playing against them four times a year, I always knew that they had the makeup. It was just they need a piece here, they need a piece there. So um if 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 I'm GM, I'm looking at how Phoenix did it because they went from the bottom literally to the top. And, they you know, did. That's not easy, but if you look at what they did, they had Devin Booker. You know, they had a, a really good player, a star and player. And they got a lot of, they got the number one overall pick with Devin Booker. DeAndre Ayton was the number one overall pick while they had Devin Booker. But the thing, the, the piece that they got was a Chris Paul. A Chris so Paul. How, do, how do we trade for a piece? This is the thing. They got Chris Paul, but they also got Jay Crowder. Yes. And they also had something with Mikael Bridges. Yes. So, I mean, it's not just, and then you look at like Cam Johnson and, you know, the campaign. Putting out, campaign. You look at the players they're putting out there, it's, it just goes together, you know what right. I mean? So, like, and I think we're in a position to do that. Like, I'm here. We already have me. We have a, a quality center, you know? We already have Ant. Like, Ant is. Yeah, man, he coming. He coming. That young fella coming, Dane. He coming. So, like, now it's like, okay. We're going to end up with two picks, most likely. Two two lottery picks, most likely. We got money. We have the full mid-level. You know, we got a lot of tools. We got a lot of flexibility. It's just a matter of us using what we have to, to fill in those pieces in the way that the Suns did. What if they trade those lottery picks and go get you a proven all-star, all-NBA player? You cool with that? Definitely, because we, I mean, we have a, a, a very big trade exception that we can yeah. turn into. So right. um, if I'm the GM, all of those things are in play. You know what I'm saying? That's my son just walked in. Yeah. All of those things are in play if I'm the GM. But that, that's why I said we got a lot of tools. You know, we got a lot of things that, that we can do to put ourselves in a much better position next season. Dame, you've been one of the guys, one of the few guys that's a superstar that says, no, you did it. You're, you're staying. You want to stay. You want to build. You, we saw what happened with Giannis because they were saying the same thing about Giannis. Yeah. But what helped Giannis is that they went and got a holiday. Yeah. They, like you said, they surrounded. Okay, we got Chris Middleton. We got Giannis. And you put another piece. Holiday was the guy that put them over the top. I don't care what it is. Giannis is Giannis. But Holiday could could lock the opposing team's best player down, hold him above uh, below his average, and go get you twenty. Yeah, I mean that's that's what it is. You know what I mean? Like Giannis was this Giannis before Drew Holiday got there. Yeah, exactly. Like he was the MVP and the Defensive Player of the Year before this. But <laughs> Correct. They went and got the Drew Holiday. They went and got Bobby Portis. You know what yes. I'm saying? Yes. These are these are very good players to me because I play against them. I right. know what they're capable of, which is right. why I understand it. But to you know the average person, they're gonna be like, he's not you know a star. They not this or that. But I know what they bring to a team, and that's all. That's all Giannis needed. And I'm not as gifted as Giannis. I'm not seven seven feet, <laughs> all that. But I can. But I have things about me that I bring to the table that like, I know how to dominate a game. And I know that, you know, if we're able to go out and get the tools that can complement me and Ant and Nerd and Nas and, you know, Josh Hart and Joe Ingles, who I love for us. I love Joe Ingles for us. Yeah. Coming off an injury. Um, but, like, when you get – when you 
when you're in a position that we're in, we can go get some guys that are very good players, like you said, that can also complement what we have and that can take us to that level. So that's what I'm looking at, you know, going into this offseason. I know Chauncey. I, uh, I was in Denver when Chauncey was in high school. Now he's your head coach. What has he brought to the table? What is it about Chauncey that you love so much about his coaching style? Uh, I think the number one thing is, um, you know, he's a player's coach, you know, from a, from a, a position of, um, you know, he's with us. Like, it's not like me and him have a tight relationship, but, you know, he don't really deal with C.J. Ellaby. You know, him and C.J., like, he's literally cool and has some type of connection to everybody, you know, and part of that is because he played, you know. So correct. He has that player energy about him. Like, he'll come out there and shoot. And before practice starts, you'll see him out there shooting and playing one-on-one in the post. And, um, you know, he's just not afraid to call it as it is. You know, he call it how you see it. He'll call you out in practice. He'll call you out in the game. Um, you know, he's won as a player. He's won in his league. And, you know, he knows what it looks like and what it feels like. And he's he's very demanding of that with our team. Um, and I think because people have to respect it because they know that he's he's done it and he's been around a long time, I think it goes – um, you know, it goes a little bit further that way. And that's my favorite thing about him is he's not in there just trying to be friends with everybody. It's like, it's a certain um, command that he has over the room, you know, when he's walking out of his office onto the court. And um, that's probably my, that's probably my favorite thing. You said something very interesting because having a, being an ex-professional football player, coaches would call even the superstars out. But I noticed in basketball, it's very rarely that if you're a superstar to the, the Dame Lillard, the Kevin Durant, the LeBron James, the, the top tier, the top eight, nine players, they normally call out somebody else when they're really talking to they're really talking to Dame or they're really talking to KD or talk, talking to LeBron. You said, I like that about Chauncey because if I mess up, I want you to tell me that I messed up so I can fix it. Yeah, I mean, don't nobody want to just offer themselves to get yelled at. You know what I'm right. saying? I tell you that they just lying. <laughs> you know, like, I, don't, I don't like to get yelled at or like to get caught out, but like I accept that. You know, right. I don't think I'm a perfect player, or I don't. You know, I shouldn't be called out for my mistakes because I make them all the time. But I think um, with Chauncey, it's it's a a level of respect there to where you know. And I had the same thing with Terry. If he was to say something to me, I would accept it. But right. Um, as long as know, it's not mean spirited, as long as long as you're not. Oh, bro, hold on now. Come on now. You do realize I'm a man. I understand that you're the coach. You're in a position of authority. But let, let's not be disrespectful with yeah, the correction. Don't disrespect me. But that's why I say it's a level of respect. Like, yeah. if I say I want to win and I say that I want these things to happen, like, I'm going to allow you to do your job so you can help me do mine to the best of my ability. And right. that's, just, that's what it is. You know, it comes with that. Are you one of these guys that when you're not playing basketball, I don't watch basketball? Cause I, I, what am I watching it for? I can't do anything. I'm not playing. Or are you watching? Are you following what's going on now? No, I'm a, I mean, I'm a, I'm a definitely a student of the game. You know, I haven't usually like during the season when I'm playing, I'm like rushing home for four o'clock to make sure the first game on the East coast that come on, you know, Detroit against Indiana, I'm going to sit there and watch it. Okay. Cause I'm always looking for action. You know, I'm looking for who's playing well, what type of things do they run? And I'm seeing that what they run. I'm like, Oh, that's our version of. Right. Whatever, whatever, you know, and right. I think that helps me um, not have to play super hard or waste a lot of energy as opposed to just thinking through the game and manipulating situations when I come across these teams. So, um, and I just like to watch who, so right. I mean, I do watch a lot of basketball, but since I haven't been playing, um, a lot of the, I guess, extra, a lot of the extra parts that come with professional sports have jumped out louder to me that I'm, now that I'm not playing. So it's, it's less attractive. So, you know, I don't, I guess I'm not watching as religiously, but I'm watching a lot, you know, right. I love to watch the game. See, that's what I couldn't like, if I'm going to play and you're going to play everybody. So it's a lot harder for you not to watch someone on television because you're going to play every single team at least twice home and away. But see, if I'm playing a team, Dame, I couldn't watch because I felt it was going to give me a false sense. If they played really bad, I'm thinking to myself, man, we're about to run through these dudes. 
if they play really, really good, now all of a sudden I'm thinking like, oh man, Ooh, we got our work cut out tonight. So I don't want to watch anybody that I might have to play. No, nah, but I mean, but for me, like I said, I'm going to go home and I'm watching all these games. So I might see, ooh, ooh, I might see Utah play three times. Right. Over a matter of seven days. I might see them play three times and we play them next week. So you're going to see them play well and blow somebody out. Then you might see them play a team that's struggling and barely beat them. Then you're going to see them lose to a good team. Then you're going to see them win two in a row and right. then play them in two games. So, like, it ain't like I'm watching them two days before we play them only and then they blow out a good team. And I'm like, man, like, we might get hit too, you know? Like, I'm, I watch it so many games that I'm seeing them have their good nights. I'm seeing them struggle. I'm seeing them get in the close game and give one up at the end. And I'm seeing them come back on the team. You know, I'm seeing so many different things about these teams, but throughout all of that, I'm seeing them execute. I'm seeing where they struggle, you know, where they struggle and how Steph is killing them defensively. Okay, how did Kyrie kill them? How did this person kill him? How, how did right. this person play against him? How did they guard this guy? You know, like, so I'm able to piece together without put writing down notes. It's like, miss me. I'm just noticing these things. Right. But, and then when I actually watch the clips, I already know what I'm getting ready to okay. see. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, absolutely it's different. I got two core, I got core side seats. I got two tickets. You and your wife going to the game. What current NBA player, who you going to see? You got, you got core side seats. Who you going to see? I got four side seats. Um, I'm going to see Kyrie Irving. <laughs> I just love the way Kyrie play. I love. <laughs> I just love the way his game looks. You know he right? ridiculous. He ridiculous, Dave. He ridiculous with them handles, man. That's ridiculous how he do it. It, it, it it's his handles, but it's just the way he move and how he can play the game. Like he got the most beautiful game ever. Like just the way it looked. I'm going to see Kyrie Irving, and um, I'm going to see Devin Booker. You like Book's game? Book, my favorite player in the NBA. The thing is, it, for the long, it used to be the big. Dump the ball down to the big, he turned around. Now it's the three. But you mentioned guys that got the mid-range game. Book is good. I mean, he can shoot the three, but Book is the mid. Book is like 15 to 18. Kyrie got it all. Kyrie is, Kyrie is the best finisher in the paint for his size as a guard that I've ever seen. From the three-point to the rim, it ain't been very many people that can see Kyrie Irving with his handles. I'm not saying he's the best player, but when you 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 watch him, like you said, you love watching his game. He can shoot the three. He got the mid-range, the English, the arc, in which he can put on the rim. I uh, can finish with either hand at the at the rim. It's just crazy. It's because it's not athleticism. It's skill. You know what I mean? Like it's, yes, he's not a bud the rim hanging in the no, air. Just no. like. It's craftiness and touch and feel. And, you know what I mean? It's just a knack for doing it. And it's it's a gift. You know, you can tell he worked on it, but he had the gift to begin with. So I, I agree with you. I agree with you for sure. Damn, we go, all sports go through this. The old guard seemed to be so unwilling to credit the new guard. Well, this guy, could he couldn't have played in my day. Ah, uh, he ain't tough enough. Why do you think it's so hard for the older players to give this current generation, regardless of sport, basketball, football, baseball, it doesn't matter. Why is it so hard for them to give credit where credit is due? I mean, I think just so they don't, so they don't, they don't feel forgotten. I think part of it is like them making sure that they're not forgotten. Like, yeah, but... It was hard when I did it. You know, today, before I give them some credit, I gotta give my I gotta make sure people know. Give my give, give my era credit. It, it was different. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes, yeah. sometimes that's true. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes it's true, but um I think more people recognize it than the people that make those comments right. realize. You know, like I know that, you know, I the game might be harder if you know, some guys played in the 90s. Just like if some guys from the 90s played in this era, it might be a little bit too much like this. Yes. Know? And the guards that was, you know, killing in the 90s might come to this era. And the coverage is now is like, you ain't, we ain't, you know, we we going to let him come off and shoot threes, but he not getting in the paint. We're going to be in the drop, you know. you Right. It's different coverages. And. You know, some people couldn't handle the ball that great. They might have got trapped and made them a little more uncomfortable. And 
the physicality might have bothered some people in our era a little bit more. Right. The lack, of, the lack of foul calls and the pace of the game being slow and being in a half court more might have limited some guys now that like to play in transition. So right. it, it's a lot of things, it's a lot of factors that go into that. But I mean, I think it's mainly because people don't want to be forgotten. You know, it's always like. Well, tell me if you agree with this statement. I'm not saying the guys are better in today's game. But I'm saying you guys are more skilled. There's more guys that can shoot the ball the equivalent, if not better than Larry Bird. Because back then, there were only a handful of guys that could shoot the ball like you, Steph, Clay, Kyrie, KD, Book. There's only, there, was only, there were not that many guys that could shoot the ball, especially from distance. And in, even in the mid-range, like you guys shoot it. I mean, like... A lot of, I mean, it, it's it's tough to think about, you know, who shot the ball this that way, you know, like just going back, you know. You, well, nobody shot the ball because now in today's game there is no bad shot. You pull it, bro. You pull it up from forty. That's a great shot. The only time you shot that shot back then in the nineties is that it was the end of the half or it was the end of a quarter. You didn't shoot that shot with fifteen seconds on the shot clock. Got to pull up in transition from thirty now. <laughs> Maybe like from 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 deep is much newer, but if you go look at Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, yeah, and you yeah. see like how coming off the screen, quick raise, has oh, yeah, he was. that was his game. Like that's where I that's where I started when I was in college and I started to watch like clips and stuff and him in high school and him at LSU and all that. Like that's when I started to like come off screen quick raise, cross, cross, quick raise, between the legs, split, pull up. Like I started doing that off of him. You know what I'm saying? So, like, but it wasn't a lot of people doing that stuff. Like, no. people pulling up and taking tough contested threes and stuff like that. It was definitely not. Definitely no, not. They, were, they weren't taking contested threes like you guys take. The way you and Steph and Clay and guys shoot the three, even with a hand in their face, you better make that. You better make that by guy put that ball on the floor and move off that three. Because if you just run out there talking about, ah, that's a, that's a bucket in your eye. <laughs> I mean, and that's like you said, guys are more skilled. It's the training, you know, the the pace that the guys train at now and the, how often people train now. Is yeah, like, you, you're right. That's 360, not Dame. Ain't no off time. Even if you guys do, I don't know how much you play golf. Or you have, you obviously, you're right. We're going to get into that. But guys train so much more now. They're always, they're constantly working on that crap. There's no sitting the basketball down for three months. I ain't touching the basketball for three months and I'm going to pick it back up. You guys are constantly in the lab trying to create a better version of yourself. When I came in the league, and it just shows you like how fast it changed. I came in the league in 2012. And I, when I got to my first training camp, it was 40 year olds, you know, I'm coming in with Jared Jeffries and I'm and other people who are coming into camp, like in training camp was when they got in shape. Like, right. I ain't touch no ball. This is when I touch the ball, you know? Right. They telling you like, man, when the season over, you got to take a break. I wouldn't touch a ball till August, you know? And you hearing that, it's like, what? Like, that just sounds crazy. Right. But it shows you now, like, when the season ends, people take a couple, you know, two weeks. They might go on vacation, come back from vacation, and only catch and shoot, get a little sweat in, some light work, and then you build from there. But right. it used to be like you just completely stop until I got to play <laughs> basketball again. So, like, the creativity and the amount of work um, that you put in on that creativity and adding things to your game is just on a different level now. All the way starting from elementary school, you're seeing – eight-year-olds out here shooting deep threes and playing off the dribble floaters, both hands and crafty with the ball. So it's, I think players now are definitely more, more skilled and they work on it a lot more. Dame, you're in the era of the player empowerment. Whereas before, you stayed with a team until that team decided to get rid of you. Now you're like, look here, get me some help or get me up out of here. Are you okay with that? Because a lot of, like, I seem like the old guard are not okay with that. They don't like that LeBron James was able to do what he did. They don't like that KD. They don't like that some of these other guys, like, you know what? Bro, y'all ain't trying to win here. I'm going somewhere else where they're trying to win, and they're going to help bring players in to help me win. It seems like the old guard is that they had to stay in one locale, 
until the, they got old and couldn't really do it anymore, and then the team moved off on them. Are you okay with the player empowerment movement? I mean, I think, first of all, to each his own. You know, like, if that's, if you, if that's what feels fine to you and makes you happy, right. then you should do it. Uh, I, I think you should do it. Uh, you know, like you said, for Brian, Brian has won a championship everywhere that he's done it at. Right. Uh, you know, he even circled back to Cleveland and won the championship. And so, like, you know, and KD the same. You know, he went to go to State. He won his two. Um, it's To me, it's to each his own. But it's it's not going to work out for everybody. You know, right. like, you'll have some people do it and it won't work out. And you just got to be prepared to deal with the downside of that. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't, if you do decide to do it and you don't win, and now they like it's not working, and this team get blown up. Now you want another team, and you know you end up on three teams, you know, or whatever in a in a short period of time. And now you use that power, and now you know people that you've used that power against is gonna be looking at you like, no, nah, when you was the man and you was making all these demands and you had all the power, now I got the power, you know. Right. What I'm and and they're gonna do you wrong because they feel violated, you know. But I don't. I don't think it's always um, that type of vibe when people say, look, I want to go somewhere else and win. I don't think it's always that, but more times than not, when guys are um, handling it in a way of like, I got the power, you know, then you just, you just making people, uh, or you putting people in a position where they're going to wait to that opportunity where your power is gone and they got the power back and, you know, they're going to try to do you wrong. And you yeah. just, you just got to be willing to deal with those consequences if that happens. Dame, you got to deal with the consequences either way. Because if you don't win, they're going to say you didn't win. And then if you go join another team, they're like, well, he went and jumped on the bandwagon. They criticize KD for going to Golden State. They criticize LeBron. And if you stay, they're going to say, well, Dame Little is one of the best players to never win a championship. So you're going to get the criticism. So you might as well be happy with whatever you're doing because you're going to get criticized either way. To me, and that, exactly. And to me, it ain't even about the criticism. Like, and that's why I say to each his own, because that's right. how I feel. And to me, it's not about the criticism. You're going to get criticized. Correct. At some point, regardless. That's what comes with our job. That's, what, that's why we make the money that we make. And that's why we play at the level that we play at, because, like, we're the best of the best. Why right. aren't you playing well? Why didn't you step up in this big moment? Like, that's, that's all a part of the game. And you're going to get criticized, and I accept that, but... That's why I take the stance that I take because there's no way around the criticism or even if I do win the championship, the following season after that, if we don't win it, I'm going to get criticized after I just <laughs> won the last year after sticking it out. So like, right. it's going to happen. So for me, it's like, if I know that, I'm just going to, I'm going to stick to my guns and do what I know fulfills me and what makes me happy and what I want to see happen because I'm going to deal with that regardless. And then when I'm done playing, you know, they're going to talk about me every six months when they're talking about some old story or whatever. But these, a lot of y'all are not going to be thinking about us like that. You right. know, y'all going to be thinking about Brian and KD and, I don't know, and Giannis. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> they, they ain't even going to come across it because of, you know, they multi-MVPs and did all this stuff. But, I mean, y'all not going to be talking about uh, us like that. So, I don't, you know, I just, I know that it comes with it. I want to win a championship. I want to win an MVP. That's what would make me happy. You know what I'm saying? That would make you happy, but it would make you more happy if you were able to accomplish that in Portland. Winning a championship, winning an MVP in Portland would make you more happy than winning it, winning those two accolades somewhere else. Correct? Am I hearing you correctly? Yeah, I mean, it, I would be extremely happy regardless. You know, and right. I think the one thing that people misunderstand when I say it is like, they think like, man, you're going to be happy regardless. And I'm like, I know I would be extremely <laughs> happy. But I'm just saying like, nobody know me like I know me. And Correct. when I go home at night and when I turn that light off and I lay my head down, don't you nobody got to deal with those feelings and what's in my head like I do. You know, you know that too. Right. And like, I want to do that and be happy with my, and be happy with myself the way that I want to be happy with myself. You know what I mean? And I know what that looks like. And that's the way that I'm trying to get it done. Russell Westbrook is having one of his worst seasons yeah. on the biggest stage. You know when you play with a team like the Lakers with what's expected of this team, championship or nothing. You play with a, a Kevin Durant or you play with a, the Boston Celtics. 
if you could give him some advice, if he were to call you and say, Dame, bruh, bro, you see, you know they own me. You hear they own me. How you think I should do? What, 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 how should, how, what should I say? What should I do? What, what's going on, bro? What, what, do, what do you see? What would, what advice would you give him? Uh, I mean, I, I, if I had to tell him anything, I would just tell him just, you know, meet, face the music with it, you know? Um, like I just said, the criticism, like, it's going to happen. And you're playing in one of the biggest markets. So I would just face it, you know? I would just, whatever the questions y'all ask me, whether I think it's a dumb question or something that is self-explanatory or whatever, just face it and deal with it or whatever. Like, his... His, Russell Westbrook's career and legacy is undeniable. Like, that's just the bottom line. The player, the career he's had, what he's accomplished, the things that he's done, nobody else has been able to do it. Like, with all these triple doubles, I don't care if you stat chasing or whatever people want to say. If I try to go every game and get a triple double for a whole season, I can't do it. <laughs> and there's a lot of other people that can't do it either. Like, exactly. that's, the, that's hard in itself to actually do it whether you're trying to do it or not right i mean he's done what he's done you cannot is undeniable so um you know like i was just saying we're going to get criticized regardless you know his may be a little more harsh because he's russell westbrook um he's playing for the lakers he's playing with lebron like you know it's going to be more harsh but um you know i would just face it and be like look you know i'm I'm struggling. I'm still working at it. I'm trying to get through it. It might not be what y'all want to hear, but I'm just, I'm trying but to. But you would acknowledge it. You you would acknowledge that I am struggling, that I'm not playing up to par, and you would not be dismissive of a question that they ask. Because I think sometimes he become confrontational. Bro, we see. You can't say you're not struggling when you go 2 of 17 or you go 4 of 21. You can't say you're not struggling because am I supposed to believe my eyes or you what you're telling me? I mean, it, sometimes you struggle, but because of the situation you're in, the market you play in, and the amount of attention you put on everything, it makes everything so much worse. Like, if you actually look at his numbers, you know, there's people shooting a worse percentage, and yeah. there's people um, averaging worse numbers. Like, his numbers are not bad numbers. It's just the actual, like, the way the game is being played may not be what people want to see or what's expected. Um, because the ball ain't in his hand all the time. He's not as much in control of the game as people are accustomed to seeing. And that's a major adjustment. Right. Nobody's ever been in his, in that position to go from, I've been Russell Westbrook my whole career, and now I'm off the ball way more. You know what I'm saying? It's just so right. much more of a different situation for him, but nobody got to live that. So it's easy to, to kick somebody when they're down and all that. But if I had to tell him something, I would just face it and just, you know, and just deal with it. But I do think, like, it didn't, going to the extreme, you know, as far as it's almost like people just see something that they think everybody's going to agree with if they just talk shit about Russell Westbrook. So everybody's just throwing their stuff at him and saying, you know, it's going overboard at this point, in my opinion. Like, it's just crazy to me. Oakland, you grew up in Oakland. When Dane was seven, eight, nine, ten years old, what did they? What did they want to be? Did they want to? Be, obviously, basketball. You had to play basketball. Did, but did did rap come into them? Did rap come into the mix? Because there was a lot of going on. You got Too Short. You got Marshawn Lynch. You got Gary Payton. Dame. Lynch. So it's it's rich soil for a lot of different things. You got a football. You got a football player. A uh, uh, Marshawn. You got Too Short, who's a rapper. You got GP, who's a, on the seventy fifth anniversary team, like yourself. So what's going on in Young Dame Lillard's mind? I mean, when I was younger, man, I was, uh, you know, I grew up in the neighborhood, so I was around everything. You know what I'm saying? I had people was outside, you know, let's just put it like that. People right. was outside and, and things were going on and I was around them and it was, I had a decision to make every day, you know, am I going to choose right or wrong? You know, whether I think I'm going to get caught or not, am I going to choose right or wrong? And I think, when you face with that type of pressure and those type of decisions every day, you know, it shapes you in a certain way, you know, especially right. you, when you're around these things, um, you know, but like you said, you, we knew who Marshawn was, you know, like my brother was cool with Marshawn. My brother, the same age as Marshawn. My dad, you know, went to high school with Raphael Sadiq and new GP and B Shaw and all these dudes, you know, so they, um, and you probably don't even know this. When you was on the Broncos, y'all won a Super Bowl. My cousin, 
my dad's cousin is Darian Gordon. Yeah, I know DG. Yeah, that's, yeah. My, that's my cousin. So, like, when you when you around all this stuff, it's just that little bit of positive that you need. You know, you just you just need that little bit of inspiration. And I always, you know, at school, everybody's be like, Gary Payton, my cousin. And this person is my cousin. And I know this person, and, you know, it was always that type of energy. And I think I held on to those types of things a little bit different. You know what just I mean? Just that little bit of positive. You're like, hold on. You know GP? And yeah. he got out. Well, he, he from here. I can get out. Raphael Sadiq, too short. Marshawn, they from this area. They got out. Why can't I? Yeah. No, I, I, I always, that's one thing I'll say is I always held on to those things like a little tighter than I think a lot of the other kids was like, right. like I'll, I'll never forget, you know, on the freeway, on a, on the 580 freeway in Oakland, like you come in, you know, it goes from Emeryville all the way to Hayward, you know, all the way through. And then when you on that freeway, it's like all of the, you know, the, the town homes up against, mm -hmm. the, against the hill. But then at the top, you got the Oakland Hills and you can always see B. Shaw. You can always see B. Shaw house the pillars on his house all, all the way from the freeway. Mm -hmm. I used to always look up there like, I'm going a, I'm to a give me a house. I'm going to give me a crib. <laughs> give me a crib up there by B. Shark crib like when I go to the league. And that's like, I always held on to that because it was like, I can literally see his house from the freeway. And like, I didn't know how to get there, but I knew like you could see it from the freeway. So just all of those things, I always held on to it real tight. You know, like, man, it's possible. Mm -hmm. Did you play? Did you play any other sports growing up? Did you play football? Did you play baseball, or was it just strictly basketball? I played baseball. I played football. I ran track. Hold on, hold on. What position you play in football? I played receiver. I played <laughs> running back. I did everything. I was nice in football too. Hold on. <laughs> so what? Man, Rather, what my, my, oh, this is the thing. My 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 mom's only brother is a, has always been a football coach. He was my coach. All my cousins, like I'm the only, my cousin is that's on our team for the Blazers, Kelgen Blevins. That's my cousin. Me and him are the only two basketball players in our family. Everybody else played football. <laughs> <laughs> so so you you, you was nice with the football? That was nice. So what what how old were you when you decided to say, you know what? Basketball is the way I'm gonna get that house up there by B Shaw. How old were you when you made that decision? Say, you know what? I'm gonna set baseball aside. I'm gonna set football aside, and I'm gonna focus strictly on basketball. Well, I stopped playing baseball early, like right about right about middle school. I got I got hit right here, and I was done. <laughs> I, I was done. But football, I stopped once I got to high school. Once I got to high school, and I had like I. And it was like I saw how big dudes was and people was getting hurt and all that. Like <laughs> on the it, it was like major injuries too. I'm like ACL and breaking know, the legs. Dislocated. Like I was just all oh, that time. I was like, I'm cool. And then <laughs> at the same time, I was also just getting, I was getting be so much better in hoop naturally. You know, right. even before I started to seriously train like that, I was just the more I was playing, I was getting more athletic. I was able to shoot. And you know, my feel for the game, just making the right plays and stuff like that was getting so much better. And then I played varsity as a freshman and that was that was it. So who did who did Dame, what players did Dame like when you were growing up? What basketball player do you like, man, his game nice. I like that. Who who did you who did you follow closely when you were growing up? Um, when I was a kid, I was a big Iverson fan. Okay. Like AI was, and it's crazy because it wasn't the details of his actual game as much as it was his swag and like him being like one of the smaller players. Mm -hmm. And he's AI was the one of the few players that gave me the energy of people that I was around. Like he right. gave me like Allen Iverson felt like he could have been from my neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> like, the tattoos, the braids, he wore tall tees, he was sagging. The way he spoke, it was like. It was like I I knew that I knew his his type, you know what I right. mean? I knew his type of person and it reminded me of a, a dude that was from what I was from. Right. And you know how hard he played, you know, and it was almost like he was he was with whatever against whoever and he was never surrounded by all the best, you know what I'm saying? And that's right. kind of why I'm like 
that's kind of like what I'm. That's what your I'm, mentality. Yeah. You're not the biggest. You don't have. You're not. You don't have top ten players all time around you to play with. But you say, you know what? I'm six foot tall, six one. I can get it done. I saw AI do it. AI led a team to the NBA Finals. He won an MVP. Hey, I think I think I'm nice like that too. Exactly. I mean, he. I always like AI. Like he. He had the style that like that appealed to a kid like me. Like everybody, everybody in my neighborhood loved AI. Like it was like and then how much this how much everybody in my in my neighborhood loved AI. We got a dude uh named we had a dude named Paul Marigny in my that was from Oakland. He ended up going to St. Mary's College and he was like the person from Oakland that was supposed to like go to the league. He mm -hmm. was like, but he ended up messing up his knee. He still was good, played overseas for a long time. But I remember him playing against a dude from my neighborhood for a hundred dollars and a pair of Iversons. <laughs> like they played they played one on one for that. You know what I'm saying? Right. So like, it just show you like he was AI was everything. You know? Right. I don't know if they're going to let you show up to the game how AI used to come to the game because Commissioner Stern, he changed that dress code. You can't come with 4XT when you're hey. when you a medium or a large, and you definitely can't come with the FUBU. All the stuff, <laughs> and, the stuff that's, that's acceptable in that tunnel today, I bet you I could get away with dressing how Iverson dressed. You stuff, think so? What? Do you not be seeing what people... <laughs> I do. I, I think some of these dudes, I don't know where they come. I mean, I saw Kuzma had, on a, had a, a sweater that was a 50 extra large. I don't know where he get that sweater from. You wear that, I can wear a tall T and some baggy <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, come on, man. I read where you gave an impassionate speech. You were very young. Um, I want you to tell me how old you were when you told your mom, says, Mom, I'm going to go to the NBA. I don't know if your mom believed you at the time. I don't know if the people that are around that heard the conversation believed. Like, look, bro, you, we don't know nobody in the NBA. We yeah. we get regular jobs. We, you know, we work nine to five. We don't go be, become professional athletes. Sure. When you were telling your mom this, do you believe that she believed you? Did you believe the other people that heard you tell her this? Do you believe they believed you? Uh, I mean, I don't think nobody out there believed it. <laughs> Keep it hundred. I don't think nobody believed it. But I remember the day. I remember the day like it was it was yesterday because, you know, my mom, the job that my mom worked, she, uh, my mom went to work every morning at four a.m. my whole life until I wow. got to NBA. She went to work four a.m. got off at three, and you know the job. They would always give her a hard time. You know, like my mom lived a, a hard life, and they right. would. Always, hard time about her production and this and that it was always something um and she was just having a real tough day that day and every day for me growing up like when i when i got out of school like we caught the bus you know what i'm saying like from right. age we caught the bus like me my brother all my cousins we caught the bus and we never went home all of us caught the bus back to the neighborhood to my grandparents house and when our parents got off of work they would all come pick us up from there so it would be, you know, five o'clock every day on school days, whatever. Around five o'clock, you know, my mom would be pulling up from San Ramon and then my auntie Van would be pulling up and then my auntie Leveda would be pulling up. And it would be about six, six cars outside just parked in front of the house. And we would all just be outside. You know, it was like a summer day, but it was right. like like a school day. And we would all just be, you know, our parents pulling up from work to pick us up. My grandmother's finished finishing up cooking, we all about to eat. And then that was when we went home. That was like an everyday thing. So I saw all my cousins and all my aunts and everybody every day because we all would get picked up. And they would sit outside in the car, you know, chopping it up or whatever. And we would all be outside playing. So, you know, this day my mom was sitting in the car by herself and my auntie Van got in the car with her. And I could tell, cause my auntie Van is her oldest sister. Mm -hmm. Her second oldest sister, but her oldest sister lived in um, in South Carolina. Okay. So um, I see my auntie Van kind of like, you know, talking my mom down and kind of like being a big sister to her. And I can see, I know what my mom is going through it. So I look right. through the window and I see my mom kind of going through it. And that's when I went beyond the glory. Remember the show Beyond the Glory was like a, a big thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, 
I just kind of went into it like, look, we not this ain't gonna last long. Like I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. And this, you know, this is pretty much how it's gonna go. And you know, from that point on, they was like, this show beyond the glory story. You know, that's right. what they kept saying everybody that was out there, but it was almost a joke, you know, because I was like announcing it to everybody. Right. And um, I honestly don't think nobody out there really believed it. You know, they was like they liked the fact that I was saying it, but I don't think they really thought like right. I don't you know if I really believed it for real. Like you were just trying to make mom feel better. You trying to live mom's spirits. I would like to do this, but I don't know if this actually gonna happen. You right. Know? You go to you go to Weber you go to Weber State. What's going on? You like hold on. Did anybody ever go to the NBA from Weber State? How? So I'm gonna be the first. I'm I'm gonna make history. I'm gonna I'm gonna be the guy that changed the uh, uh, the curse the the poverty curse that stricken my family that got us living here because I know I want better for my mom. I want better for my kids. I'm gonna be the one that break this curse. But I'm gonna have to do it from Weber State. I'm not going to do North Carolina, UCLA, Kentucky, yada yada yada. I'm gonna do it from right here. At that point, I was delusional. <laughs> <laughs> and that was probably my biggest. That was probably my biggest strength is how delusional I was at that point. Right. Because when I showed up on campus, I literally was like, "I'm gonna go to the league." I never thought like how many people made it from Weber State or. You know, the scout our scouts gonna come watch or none of that. Like I showed at that up, time, Dame. At that at that time, Dame. How tall are you? How much do you weigh? When I got to Weaver, I was about five eleven, maybe one sixty five. Okay. And then I got there, and you know, I realized that you know I didn't I didn't work hard enough, and you know I didn't play hard enough. I didn't play fast enough. You know, I started to just realize, like, man, this, this is a little harder than our, I thought. We had our first conditioning test, and, like, I, was, I damn near died, you know? Like, and I was just like, man, like, if this is how hard it is at Weber State, like, can I, is this really what it meant for me? You know what I'm saying? Like, right. I really questioned that after the first day to myself. Yes. Like, this is hard. And um, the most important thing in that experience was I met Phil Beckner, who's my trainer right now. And, okay. you know, he was the person, and obviously I had, you know, my AAU coach, another father figure to me, Raymond Young, Phil Taylor, Dame Jones, you know, like all of those dudes kind of grabbed me in high school and they're the ones that helped me get to that, the point where I was getting recruited because I wasn't getting recruited for a long time. But when I got to Weaver, I met Phil Beckner, who was my trainer now, and he he was on my ass. Like, you're not good enough. You don't play hard enough. You don't shoot good enough. Your handle ain't tight enough. You don't get enough reps. You'd rather be, you know, hanging out. You don't get in the cold tub. How many shots did you make? Get to, like, he used to be waiting outside of all my classes that started at 9 o'clock at 8.50. Like, you need to be here. Like, and he taught me what it meant to work hard. And, you know, mm-hmm. everybody on campus thought me and Phil was crazy because it was like we was working out on campus in the arena at a local rec center. We was just all over the place, just working, 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 working. And, you know, I just made a jump from my first year to the end of my, from the start of my first year to the end of my first year, I was first team all conference as a freshman. In my second year, I stayed. So between that first and second year, I stayed at school with Phil the whole summer. And we just worked out, worked out, worked out. The next year I was MVP. And then I got on the draft boards after that. Like I was on the draft board after my sophomore year Mm -hmm. and he just kept pushing me. It was like nothing, nothing was good enough. So like once I got that little bit of taste, I saw my name on that mock draft and then Phil was like blowing up Adidas, you know, like he was sending, like he, he still probably got it to this day, a hundred emails, just sent them begging them to let me come to Adidas nations where, you know, scouts would be there. Maybe players would play the top college players would play. And i never forget on my birthday, it was my birthday. I was in Utah during the summer, July 15th. And um, they sent the, e- the email came back and I got in like two dudes. Like it was somebody from Baylor and somebody from Kansas pulled out and I got in and I went to Chicago. And that was the first time where like I played in front of scouts and all that stuff. And then that was pretty much it. Dame, we're going to, I'm going to get you out here on this one. When it's all said and done, What's Dame Lillard's story? How how does Dame want his story written? How does Dame Lillard write his story? 
I mean, I'm writing it as I go, you know, but I think when I'm done playing, I want people to look back and be like, you know, not only did Dame have a great career on the floor, you know, he, he accomplished a lot on the floor, but I want people to, to look back and, and understand how much BS goes on, you know, in this industry and what happens behind the scenes versus what people get told publicly and the narratives and all these different things. You know, I want people to remember me like he got it done on the court and everything that people said about him and everything that he said about himself and everything that he said he stood for. Everybody we've ever talked to checked it off and said it was it was the realest of the real. And there was no do this behind closed doors and do something different publicly. Like, that's what I want people to remember me for the quality of the, the quality of the person that I've been able to to be along with the quality of, you know, player that I've, I've become, you know, and the status and all the things that I've accomplished in my career. I'm gonna get you out of here on this one. I need your Mount Rushmore rappers, four guys, Mount Rushmore, and I need your Mount Rushmore NBA players. Mount Rushmore rappers, I'm gonna go with um, Tupac. I'm gonna go with Jay-Z. I'm going to go Tupac, Jay-Z, Lil Wayne, and I'm going to go Biggie. Biggie. That's a hell of a list. Okay, NBA players. NBA players, I'm going to go MJ, Bron, Kobe. And I'm going to say uh, Magic. A nice list. Nice list. Like, I really like the I really, I really like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rap because I don't know how you have a, a, a Mount Rushmore if Tupac ain't on it. I don't care what anybody say. I, I know there's some great young rappers, and if you ain't, if you got a Mount Rushmore and Tupac ain't on it, I'm throwing your list in the trash. <laughs> yeah, Pac gotta be on. <laughs> Dame, I really appreciate you giving me a little bit of your time today. I know you're busy. Heal up. I need you to come back as Dame Dollar because I need you letting them go for the logo like you did before this injury. I know you will. Best of luck. Again, thanks, my man. Hey, man, don't worry. Trust me. <laughs> Not All worry. right. You know, I got, you know, I got you on my end. You hold up your end, I got you on my end. Yep, for sure. Appreciate it, bro. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why. All my life, I been grinding all my life. Yeah. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why. All my life, I been grinding all my life.